Okay, hey. How's it going? Um, all right, my name's Matt, and this is Travis Motley. I'm Tyler. Um, and uh, Shane, the other guy who was on the, on the stage, he had to head back home. Um, but uh, we're here for a moment to talk about songs that sing. Um, and I guess before I dive into um, things, and these guys are, are up here to uh, interject and help me uh, stumble my way through this, through my ADD uh, self and how I process life. Um, but before we get into this, how many of you are, are um, maybe not songwriters, you're just maybe interested in hearing about church songs, church music, how, how it's chosen or how it's produced or, okay. And then how many of you would be like, I'm interested in, in the act of songwriting and, and growing in that? Okay, about 50-50. Okay, that's good. Well, um, I um, I guess I'll start by saying um, uh, p people call me a, 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 a modern hymn writer, and sometimes people say, "What is a hymn?" and "What is what is that?" You know, um, a hymn to me is a church, um, a, a a song that the church sings for a long time. That's what a hymn is. Um, there are reasons for why they sing it for a long time. Um, uh, you could say, you know, um, aesthetic reasons or um, a number of reasons why. Um, but it's a hymn is a is a song that the church sings for a long time. And um, I guess I, I don't know um, if my songs fit that mold yet because. Um, I'm still alive, um, but maybe maybe one day they will be. But we, um, I write with a guy named Matt as well. He and I write toward that goal. That is that's the end goal, um, and uh, we try to write songs. Um, another way we say it sometimes is we write songs for people who can't sing, um, which is a little bit uh, of a mean thing to say, but. Um, it basically, um, church music is, is folk music, um, and folk music is, uh, the church is sort of a filter of, because um, that's kind of what folk music is. Folk music is music that has been filtered through a geographical or cultural location, and it's art, the artifacts that remain after said given of time. And um, these songs, you know, th th they sort of endure the test of time. Time is a wonderful mirror. Time uh, shows you what things are, and uh, and community as well. And folk music is is the the sort of um, um, the, the compress that happens with 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 time and community come together and decipher what is what is a good song and what isn't a good song, and songs make it through and they they last and endure. And um, and so. My, my friend Matt and I, we, we really try pretty hard to be slow about the process of how we write. Some songs we've written have taken three or four years. Some songs have taken you know, three or four months. Um, it's, it's somewhat uh, fluid on that spectrum, but um, time is a great mirror. And, um, and our goal really, as we're writing these songs is, when you think about folk music, folk means of the people, right? So when you think about um, the church as a sort of filter of folk music, it, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create songs that kind of don't need us, that, that are transparent in a way that um, it's, it's quite a hard, I, I mean, I, I've grown to really appreciate this challenge and the struggle of um, because you know uh, um, all art is sort of this balance of order and chaos you know mystery and clarity and familiarity unfamiliarity and w and with a with church music you know you're trying to do that same thing but it, it's it's got to land pretty heavy on the order side the familiarity side for folk music but it does have to have this aspect of interest and unfamiliarity and chaos in order to be distinctive or else it's just you know Da 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 da. You know, you, you have to have distinctiveness in in, in a melody, um, or or a lyric. Obviously, I'm more of a melody person, so that's I, I speak from that uh, perspective. 
Um, but um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll filter this through my story. Maybe this will help um, in some way to make it more personalized and, and less abstract. I um, started out my career in music. Um, I was kind of doing this, uh, you call it like CCM, I guess you could say. Um, I, was, I was doing worship music, but I was, um, I was kind of doing more concert-oriented kind of things and writing music in that way. And, but I always had this interest in classical music and hymns and folk music. And so I would write those things sort of in a peripheral uh, way, just um, on the side. And uh, some of those things really began to kind of have a life of their own. And it was really, really just um, humbling and I would say meaningful for me to watch that happen, for me to, um, uh, you know, actually uh, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an author, I forget who said it, but it's, he was saying one of the, determina- the determining factors on whether something is like pop music or folk music is, um, is if is if a personality is required to sort of pull it off, you know. So, pop, there's not not one is wrong or, or right or wrong, but pop music, or say, say like a, a Lady Gaga song or Katy Perry song or whoever song, uh, Kendrick Lamar or whatever, it requires the personality of Kendrick Lamar, or Katy Perry, um, Lady Gaga to execute the song. Whereas with, so with folk music, you actually don't. Um, the personality is is like a kind of a distraction almost in a way like that the the um the song itself can exist within thousands of personalities does that make sense um th- because there's a transparency to it there's a communal nature to it there's a there's a sense in which this is the church's song this is not Matt's song so as i watched that sort of start to take place i found my i found myself uh, thinking like, like, that's like that's a really cool mission um, to lean into and to go after, and and a, and a service and a craft to learn. And so, really, for the past six years or so, I've really leaned leaned into this craft, and I, and I do see it as that. And um, you know, I guess I could talk for a second, maybe about uh, what makes a hymn a, hy- a a hymn other than a song the church sings for a long time. You know, hymns have a obviously like a, a, a lyrical density, so it was like a poetic quality. Um, that's one like characteristic, and then and then melodically there there's um, there's a, a, a density, I guess, to the to the melody. There's longer phrases in the melody. Um, it, it, there's you know, whereas pop music, it's usually three to four notes repeated. You know, da da na da na na. Da, na, na, da, na, na. That's kind of pop music. A hymn is, is, is oftentimes totally unrepeated. You know, it's running all over the place. Um, so, and then, but as it goes back, da, 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 da. so so there is a sense in which there's there's hook and there's um, mirroring of phrases, but they're they're f- separated further apart. And what that tends to do. It tends to um, to you know when, I, when it's when it's done well, it tends to prevent boredom from happening, right? So that 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 space that's created in the melody gives your gives your mind a, 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 a exploratory place to go, and then you're back, and so that's why they tend to endure for years and years and years, as opposed to months. Um, and again, n- not one is not better than the other. Pop great pop song is you know. Um, serves an awesome purpose. Um, makes you want to dance and shake your booty. Um, but but um, it, it, it's just a different a different goal. So um, so where where was I, I, I was going somewhere with that? Um, oh yeah. So so that being said, like there, there's a there's a, a melodic I would say complexity you might say, um, um, and and so. One of the things I, I, I try to think about as we're writing hymns, it's like the, uh, a hymn is like a song where if you take the separate the lyric and the um, melody, they each can stand alone as art by themselves. Um, so this could be just a beautiful piece of poetry, lyrics by itself, or this could just be a beautiful piece of music. You know, da 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 da. Um, and often, you know, one of the things that um, 
um, that I've learned over the past five or six years of really doing this, to me, the best hymns, you know, like some hymns come from classical tradition, some hymns come from folk tradition, but um, the best ones, it's almost hard to tell if they're like a classical melody or a folk melody because there again, it's the it's the um, it's the transcending thing that 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 great art has. It can fit. It can you can do it with an orchestra and it can be this like powerful. Um, you know, symphony, or you can do it in the living room and it can be this humble, simple thing and still just as stirring. And that's the mark of a great melody. The mark of a great melody is if, you know, you can, it's like high church and house church. You can do it anywhere with any band, any context, and it's, and it's stirring, it's moving, it's powerful. Um, so we try to think about it that way. Let's separate the melody over here. Is this just like beautiful music as it is? And we try to separate the lyric over here. Is this like interesting poetry? as it is, and obviously it's more than poetry, it's, it's, um, it's doctrine, it's teaching the faith, it's, it's um, worship toward God, um, but then like the power is, you bring those two things together, then you've got something that's really, that's gonna, gonna, gonna do something in the world, you know, um, so that's, that's kind of how we are trying to write these songs that we write, um, and uh, Matt and I, we, 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 would start, we started about 12 years ago. We would get together every Wednesday at like 10 o'clock on Skype. Skype, was, it wasn't Zoom back then, it was Skype. Um, which, which, by the way, how did they lose that? I mean, they had like an eight-year head start. What, how did they? Um, so we would get together, and, and we would work s very slowly, but this, something about the slowness kept us honest because, like I, when I talked about boredom, Boredom is a really important thing in in the creation of art, and even or or the consumption of art too, where you you're writing this song and after about six months or eight months it's like you start to hate hate the melody. Well, that tells you that tells you something. You know what I mean? It's like maybe you should should trash it or tweak it or something, so that it it has a vibrancy and, and a sturdiness where you, where you don't get bored. Um, and you know, same with the lyric, obviously. Um, a lot of these, a lot of songs, like a, a, a good example of finding a song um, with Christ Our Hope and Life and Death, we worked on that for probably about two years, kind of crafting it, and then at the end of those two years, we were like, we started to, to use it, I, I was doing work with the Gettys, and we would do their concerts, and we'd go out and play the song, and then we'd kind of go back, and oh, that stinks, let's, you know, let's change that that melody part, it's like the people are kind of singing a different thing than what we were doing, so let's just like try doing what they were doing and, you know, change that. So so there's all these different ways of, um, of finding um, the, the church's song, you know, of, of, of um, you know, it, it's, it's, it really is an art and a craft of bringing something out of your own soul that, that stirs you, um, and at the same time resonates with people that I, I have this, oh, as I'm writing songs, I have this like, I, um, he, he has various names, but he's like a deacon at the back of the church. He's like uh, Deacon Billy, we'll call him. And Deacon Billy is just like a good old boy and he's, he's an old man and he just kind of does his thing. Um, and he sits with his arms crossed and like, I, I want a song that Deacon Billy can sing. You know what I mean? I want to. I want to make a song um, that has a, a melodic simplicity. It's so simple, you know, that, that a child or like Deacon Billy, he can he can sing it and wants to sing it. You know, that's that's the other thing. You don't want, just want a song to be singable, like food edible. You want it to be enjoyable. Um, so I often have that when, when I'm like. Because I, I come from the artist world, and, and this, this season for me has been, in a sense, uh, uh, s a, um, pivoting a little bit to, um, to be a little more transparent in how and what I'm doing, and to take some of the, I wouldn't say take the artistry out of it, but I would say to take my, my personal taste out of it in a, in a way as a service, and, and to find ways that I can add distinctive flair and, and character to songs, but that keeps a simplicity and a familiarity to where anyone, you know, a, a, a child can sing. What, by the way, kids kids know what good stuff is. You know, it's really amazing. I mean, kids know stuff. They, like, 
when often when I'm writing songs at the piano, uh, usually my thing in the morning, I like wake up and I kind of tinker um, on the piano. I, I don't really have an end goal. I just like wake up and just tinker. And I'll, you know, a few notes will hit and they'll, a pattern will kind of merge and I'll kind of, okay, I'll follow that. And then, you know, so a lot of songs kind of come from that. And then my kids, you know, sometimes they'll like sing it back to me and, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, I, like I need to pay attention to that. Um, Cause they're smart. Um, so um, that's a lot of rambling. Gosh, um, do do you guys have any thoughts or questions? Yeah, Mr. Twit, you should you should be up here by the way. There are there are people in in this room who know so much more about this stuff than I do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and the trick sometimes is to introduce something that feels fresh. Yeah. And usually in a story like him, third line, you go somewhere that wasn't expected. Right. But it can't be so far away. That That's right. People off. That's like yeah. Isn't that kind of what you're trying to? But, but I'm curious if you write the music or the words first or if it's kind of just both. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, for, for, for me, I tend to be more of a, of a melody guy, a composer, than a lyricist. My friend Matt is more of the lyricist. So, but, but my, my routine for the past four years or so has been to write one or two or three melodies every day. So like a hymn melody and I'll send it off to, to Matt and Keith and a few of the other people. And so, you know, I end up with, with a big stack of melodies, uh, most of which like I'll send, I'll send to the group and no one responds to anything. So it's like, <laughs> no, that's like really encouraging. But every once in a while, someone would be like, hey, that, I kind of like that one. That kind of has something. So it's like, great. Tuck that away. Um, but I, 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 I have a, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a crass uh, metaphor, but I kind of have started to look at some of this process almost like you think about like you hear like people talk about sales where you like just knock on doors and you knock on a hundred doors. You might get 10 people who respond and out of that 10, you might get, you know, I think so. I think, I think that creating art is, is a numbers game. It's, uh, you find quality through quantity you know so you you knock on doors you just you just make stuff make stuff make stuff make stuff make stuff and you have no idea I mean when we wrote his mercy is more which is our my most famous song um, it just felt like every other song I've ever written you know it's, it's like we were just you know writing a song um, I, I was I was we were writing with Matt Redman maybe three four months ago and he said the same thing about bless the Lord my soul it was like 11 o'clock at night, his publisher was like, hey, I really need one more song. It's like, you got to hit this deadline. It was just, I need one more idea. And he, and he was just, da, 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 da. I mean, he thought it was the stupidest, simplest little thing. <laughs> Sends it off. And, um, and you know, they, they were like, hey, they might have something you should go for. You know, so it's just so uh, hard to comprehend um, the complexity of what makes something good in this art space you know the the mood you're in and the the timing of the culture and the 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 instrument you start the idea on I mean the complexity is it just it, it, it's it's infinite and overwhelming and so you have to just like just pound out generate content and ideas um, in order to 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 press through that complexity um, so I, that's a very long-winded way of, of answering, but oftentimes what happens is, for us, Boz will send like he'll send a title. Boz is really good at titles, um, and so he'll send me like an eight-word title, say, and I'll it'll like speak to me musically, and it'll have you know. So I'll write a melody to that title, and so that's sometimes it starts that way. Sometimes like like uh, the song we did this morning, Lord from Sorrows Deep I Call. That one was just a melody. It wasn't there wasn't any lyric or anything. It was just the melody I composed, um, and we wrote like three or four different lyrics to it to try to you know. So sometimes the the lyric is the slave to the melody. Sometimes the melody is slave to the lyric. Um, you kind of walk that line and dance that dance. Um, but um, 
but yeah, that's that's our process. I mean, and, and now we, we still get together about once a week or so, and s- with some more with retreats and things like that. Um, but um, but yeah, that's kind of our Actually, our thing. Yeah. 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 Certainly not. Yeah. Yeah. It it was it was it was that journey. I know. I think. Um. Obviously, I think meaning can be found in any uh, field of work where you view it as a service, right? So you know, uh, pop music or or anything. But I think. For me, I, I I don't think I was doing that. Um, I think it was it was a little more of in my ego, and then this thing was happening with the, with the hymns that that was more of a uh, it felt like more of a mission and more of a of a calling or craft, and and less of an ego thing. So yeah, so that 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 kind of has been some of my story with that. And not to say that'll be everybody's story. It, it can it can go all kinds of different. Uh, ways sideways, up ways, down ways. But um, what other what other questions do you guys have? Yes. I have no idea. <laughs> oh right. Uh, oh yeah. The question was, how do you balance adding musical interest while keeping the melodic simplicity, right? Um, I actually have no idea. I don't know how you do that. I think that is the the question is the answer. It's it's um, when you, as you're working as you're writing, I think as long as you have that question in your head, that that's what you want. You know, um, you want that that balance. Yeah. Can I speak to that just yeah. a smidge? I think about um, we. It, j- it applies to a crafting a song, but also to crafting like a worship set or a Sunday morning experiences. Okay, what, um, like for a service, you would realize you wouldn't choose every song to be a new one, right? So you want to have some songs that are familiar and some that are interesting or so- somewhat new. And so I think it's a, it's a tension to manage rather than like a problem to fix that it's like, you know, we we talk about it in terms of like, okay, what are we hiring in this service to be the interest moment? You know, and then what's setting up that interest? If you surround something that's wildly crazy and really different for your people, you know, you probably need to surround that moment with something that's really familiar. You know, just otherwise, it, it, it's endless. Like what Matt was saying, there's so many options of how you can craft that moment. Um, but it's managing that tension is uh, is that it's it's never. That's that's the that's the beauty of art. It's that balance of order and chaos and familiarity and unfamiliar, unfamiliarity. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. You, Travis. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> question was pretty much like, how do we go about uh, yeah, changing things up? Right. Right. Well, there was. Uh, we were talking earlier with a couple, couple guys, and uh, a few questions were raised, like, um, how do you go into a set? Like, what's planned? You know, we have a set list. We know. Hypothetically, we know the keys of the songs unless they're changed when we last minute, something like that. But um, uh, I believe it was this morning you sent like the song names with kind of like a vibe, like uh, come behold with more energy or um, um, almost home, more dramatic. So we're using those terms that he's just, um, that's kind of what he's envisioning uh, for the different songs, and we're interpreting in our own manner, in our own way. So, one verse on the on the drums, one verse may be more timid and more tame, where the next verse 
uh, may come all the way down, but then it rises on the second half in a more dramatic way to kind of say something. And I'm playing a bombastic, like really loud instrument. So I've got to be able to create some sort of using nuances and, and somehow figure out how to be elegant with these shells of monsters. And I think that kind of is fitting on every instrument, bass, guitar, piano, um, and even vocally. Like you could sing the same melody, um, but he may drop out or pull back from the mic and let the crowd, you know, kind of lead that because um, that's an important part of like collaboration with, with the crowd. Um, and I, I, and I like to add to that, I, I like to think about how different genres of art kind of, um, I like to think about different genres of art through the lens of other genres of art. So like, like um, for example, I think great song arrangers are storytellers. You know, I think if you think of an arrangement of a song as a story, that can give you a really nice framework. You know, a, a story in the, in the sort of classical sense is like, uh, exposition, um, climax, recapitulation, or something. I don't know for you grammar people. You, you know, it's but, but it's like like that, right? So you know, you, you've got a verse, you know, you've got a chorus, and you've got a bridge, and it's kind of how a song functions in a way. And you think about every other in every instrument in the band. Um, you know, if you're th thinking of uh, as as a, as a storyteller, I think it, it it can be it can be helpful, or even colors, you know, moods. Um, can can be helpful as well. Yeah, I talk in colors and moods like at, at my studio all the time. Mm -hmm. Even with vocalists, it's like, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but like, can we make it sound a little more yellow and bright and poppy? Or like, I'll say terms like, let's add some air on top of that. But we do that live as well. It's it's art, yeah. so it's yeah. kind of unexplainable. Well, but I think what's tricky, and even for some of our younger musicians, one of the ways that that I that I learned early on, I was around. I was in a studio for a project. This was before I was with Matt and years. I mean, I was in college and I was hearing these other players talk about like, oh man, I wish the chorus had this, um, I want the chorus to sound like a Coldplay song that I hadn't, it was some deep track of Coldplay or whatever. And, but I learned over time that being a student of other genres informs you to be able to create good m music in your moment. Cause nothing is new. Everything is just reorganized. You know, when you're playing in the same scale, you've got eight notes, generally, particularly in worship music. You know, you've only got, the, the, the lanes are pretty narrow. But when we come to a moment, sometimes you're like, oh man, I really need this chorus to feel like a mix of Mumford Sons and the Killers. You know, <laughs> and, and like we, that's like a, li but it's like, as a musician, there's some of that, like, you almost have to catalog and listen to a lot of music in order to have, what are those musical levers that you can pull to, um, to bring in those different elements. And that's just taking time as a musician, kind of being a student of the craft. I think that uh, I would just encourage you to, you can digest and consume a lot of music and just file all that stuff away. Okay, what, if somebody says, I want this to sound like you too, what does that mean? You know, if someone says, I want this to sound like Josh Groban, what does that mean? You know, and like there's all these kind of different categories that we think about, because these are the kind of pop sensible art kind of categories, but it's also how your people think. You know, as you think about what's gonna be working and communicate these, uh, communicate to your people at your church, um, they they know these categories, whether they consciously know it or not. And one, one good point to that is uh, his mercy is more this morning. We, in the notes he sent, we did it more, uh, we did it with more of a swing, like a ta instead of just bomb, 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 bomb. And we don't do that every time. But sometimes that can bring more of like a settling spirit to us and maybe you, and if, or vice versa. But we never know if we're going to swing it or not. Because um, we may get to the outro of the song, and by that time we may not be swinging the song. Right. And that's perfectly fine. And it, that's kind of intuition. Your intuition mm -hmm. starts to kick in, and, and you are feeding off of one another that's kind of and I, yeah. I think what what these guys have just talked about in in a different you know in roundabout ways is a really helpful um, it, it's a helpful reminder to me 
that the sort of foundational choice to make is to is is songs that the church sings and wants to sing and then adding on top of that the the vibe if you will the the cool and the interesting and the flair you know so b- because you don't you don't want to choose based on that right because the point of a sunday gathering is for the church to sing um I- if if you just like do cool vibes and like rad vibes then it's like i mean it's cool but it's not you could the use g- the word personality it's not the goal yeah it's not the goal so um the goal is b- but but the goal is not either or right the goal is not because you've got like churches who are oh, we just do like piano acoustic guitar and we sing like really uh you know we sing all old hymns and songs that people can sing you know but it's like it's not cool and then you've got over here it's like we just do like a bunch of cool songs and it just sounds really cool but but maybe or maybe maybe a lot of people are not really singing them you know the goal is to bring those two things together to bring those two worlds together you want the 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 foundation and the the strength and the sturdiness of songs that people sing and you want to you want to lace it with 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 interest and artistry and and beauty and all those things next question Yeah, yeah. And, and go for it from that. Yes. Or is it always oh, yeah. Like yeah, okay, so that's a good question. Do, do you ever think of a topic, uh, and when you write songs, do you ever think of a topic that you want to start with as opposed to, say, a phrase yeah. or a musical phrase or a, a lyrical phrase, a yeah, hook? Um, yeah, definitely so. Um, there's, um, you know, I, I, I've been trying for a while now to sort of write Jesus paid it all again. You know, b- basically that that concept, that idea um, packaged in a, in a new way because it's just such a powerful concept. Um, so, yeah, we, we start with we start with that all the time. Bit like um, uh, um, the Augustine, like a lot of his writings. um like I really want to do a song. Well, I guess that that would be built on a phrase. Like Kristen um, uh, Getty has this phrase she uses, like um, "With deepest relief, we lift our eyes to you." So I always really like that, and to combine that with some of Augustine writing about "Restless till we rest in you." And so um, a lot of times, sermons, listening to sermons, you know, I think like we need to. Yeah. So so uh, I think it's all both and yes. Yeah. There are plenty of plenty. In fact, every other song is oh God, you're so big and we're all impressed. Okay. But if I need something about serving my neighbor, yeah. or loving my brother. Yeah, it's harder to find those. It's yeah. It's hard to find that stuff. Yeah. And in, in several cases, my wife's a songwriter and you know, we'll just Yeah. go ahead and bang one out. Yeah. In yeah. Three days, you know, to Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's given that that's the theme of his message this week. Yeah. I can't find anything. Right. So yeah, no, I think it's great a great practice to sort of write in the holes, you know, find what are the holes, you know, um, songs on the return of Christ, s- con- songs of confession, songs on loving and serving your neighbor, songs on mission. Um, you know, there, there there's and Kevin would probably know more than me, but th- there's there's a lot of those holes and and writing into those um, is a very wise thing to do. That's great that you do that. You create your own necessity. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're educating yourself and, you know, sharing your heart with the other out. That's great. Sorry, I didn't say that in the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I hope some of this has been helpful. Yes. Um, how do you approach songwriting spiritually? I'm going to ask you to... Elaborate. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I, I, you know, honestly, how I feel about that is, I, and I hope this doesn't sound like arrogant or something, but I, I kind of feel like when I'm playing piano, I am playing piano spiritually. You know what I mean? Like I, I feel like I feel like it's like the 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 the, the, the what's this guy um, Eric Little? I feel God's pleasure when I run. You know, it's like just the act of running is. Um, some people would say is uh, uh, um, just sort of spatial and it just sort of um, biological, but but I but for him it was spiritual, you know it was it was the just the simple act of running, and um, I think I feel that you know so I, I don't I don't know that I get get really in a zone or or something, I think I just just when I play piano I feel God's pleasure you know I think. Yeah, that was a good question. Yeah. Just that, um, like, um, I guess the reverse is sort of volunteer sometimes. So if you're young and you play a PG and E. Okay. For about a year. I love how you worded that. F2. I'm so proud of that. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But um, and then you guys play in a church band, like, and that's what you all do. Yeah. So you know that, like, the kinds of things that I have to do is, like, okay, this drummer cannot play in key. Yeah. All of the songs are going to be in four, and yep. ooh, shoot, where's that one that we've got to throw in? Okay, piano only on this one. You know, th- those are the kinds of things that we're navigating. And so I appreciate, too, that there's a good variety that you guys are putting out for us with good lyrical content, because it can be, it's so limited what we can do from Sunday to Sunday, you know, like, mm-hmm. we've got to have some hymns, but it's all got to, you know, so mm-hmm. when we That's good. Yeah, man. Uh, what is your vision for the next generation of worship leaders, um, firemen, songwriters, um, and just even want to put albums out? Like, what's your word of wisdom that you would say um, for the next, the upcoming generation? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Words of wisdom for the next generation for worship leaders, songwriters, uh, general words of wisdom. Um. Gosh. Collaboration. A lot of what we've talked about is collaboration. Like someone who's good at lyrics and someone who's good at melodies. And then for the younger generation, same thing, but like someone who may be a stronger musician and not a worship leader, but someone who's a worship leader, but the both of them want to get better at songwriting. Um, collaboration's a big part of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say too. Um, the the principle of bloom where you're planted is really big, um, and doing creative work uh, with your people in mind, and like kind of like what you were saying about submitting to the moments that you're stewarding, will ultimately be the most life giving. If if where you are is not where you want to be and you're always chasing somewhere else, that's a rat race. Like you literally will never get there. Um, and and so I think blooming where you're planted, submitting to the moment and just serving faithfully um, and always doing the best you can. Like you, if you have an opportunity to lead worship or to play music or anything, every single time it matters. You have no idea who's in the room. There could be the first time that a person like hears that song and it could touch their heart and change their life. And and I firmly believe that God really does work in moments. He does work in time and we get to steward those like that time. And you're when you're on platform, you're asking everybody in the room to look at you and you get to be a window or a mirror up to the king and that's that's a tremendous gift. And so every single moment matters. And so don't be flipping at any, you could be leading worship for your small group, like practice, 
show up prepared, like lead faithfully, lead like you mean it. And, um, and I think the Lord honors that type of submission, that type of humility. Um, and and it, it, what's, what's really amazing is when, you, when our heart sits in that place, then it doesn't matter what size the stage is. It doesn't matter how big the audience is because, it, you know, it's so funny. I sent, a, um, I sent a picture to my team at church today of the venue that we were playing in this morning. And, um, and it was so silly because it was, well, one, it was such a cool room. That's why I was sending the picture. But one of my guys, he said, he sent texts back like, oh, the audience of one because the room was empty, <laughs> you know. And because um, <laughs> he obviously knew that I was taking the picture. But, it, but the reality is, is like that really, that has to be our heart. It, it has to be. Otherwise, like you, you will burn out. You will, you will chase something else and it won't last. And so kind of building and investing in those types of rhythms as young as you can, I think will set you up uh, for the long haul. Um, uh, this would probably apply to like more songwriters, but, but I, th I think focusing on great songs, um, uh, there's a, an example that Keith uh, brought, has brought up to me a couple times that um, Simon and Garfunkel and Bridge Over Troubled Water, you know that song? Like, well, the, the, the genesis of that song and that album that, that was first on, I, I guess the story goes, they had an entire album and um, it was kind of finished and they were like kind of at the end and, and they were like, well, I really think this album needs something else, you know? And so they, you know, Bridge Over Troubled Water come, you know, and, 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 they, and they had like, they had the tour set, they had everything ready for the album and they then they then they added Bridge Over Trouble Water to the album, and like the manager or the executive producer, or somebody was like, you know, scrap the tour, scrap everything. It's everything now is Bridge Over Trouble Water. Like that is that's the song. That is everything now. So because great songs have an energy of in and of themselves, you know what I mean? Um, they have a life force. They have well, this sounded very like mystic. Um, they have like. Th there's just an energy there, you know what I mean? And, and so an, an energy that transcends um, good or bad playing, to your question, uh, you know, to your comment. It transcends style, it transcend, transcends genre. You know, uh, and, and uh, you know, a great song, and what a song is, is, is a, a lyric and a melody. Um, a great song, you know, has uh, an amazing energy and, 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 and power. You know what I mean, and so writing them, choosing them, you know, all the, you know, I'm not obviously um, that is is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but I think it's a good like picture to have you know in our minds. You know what I mean? Good standard. Um, any other final questions? Or do we have five more minutes? Oh, we got five more minutes. Well, time for a couple more questions. Don't be shy. I want some more from this crew. If there's no more questions, that's okay. I got, I got one more yeah. It's like from a pastor's perspective yeah. to our worship pastor and, and then to you mentioned staff, what is helpful for me to provide to them, and I, I have some of that too, but I'm, I'm approaching, right, to equip them to shepherd and lead well and, and to know it's not just feeling like I've got it in every song selection or every thematic movement or some, you know, there's certain elements. Um, gosh, oh yeah, <laughs> the question was so uh, complex, I don't know if I can repeat it. What can you do as a pastor to, to be um, a shepherd to your worship teams as they plan and select and prepare and write? How can you be a shepherd to them as they shepherd your congregation? Is that fair? Um, so I think to, to, to this guy's point, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, to his point, I think you can add a great perspective in like what the holes are. You know, if you look at zoom out and say we're going to sing forty different songs this year as a church or fifty or whatever it is, you know, these are the kind of the, the missing theological pieces. Does that make sense? Um, and you as a pastor can probably see that a little better than they can, oftentimes. And so for them, for you guys to 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 corroborate your 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 planning. 
um, I think is helpful. But then I think if you also can zoom back, I guess, emotionally, um, and not just like intellectually or, or lyrically, but emotionally, I think you 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 want to fill in the holes as well. You know, so you want uh, because one one of the like metaphors I use sometimes when I think about songwriting, and I think about like a, a, a lot of Christian songs to me are guilty of, especially a lot of people who are writing modern hymns. It's like a beautiful lyric, and but the, the melody is just like wooden and it doesn't stir you and it's just kind of blah, it just kind of falls flat, right? Um, it's almost like whenever my daughter um, comes up to say my son and they've gotten in an altercation and a fight and um, you know, one of them's like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? And, and it's like, so the, the, the tone of what she said actually changed the meaning of the word it does it didn't mean i'm sorry anymore it meant like i'm resentful and i don't like you get away from me <laughs> she's not actually sorry so when you when you write lyrics about god and his character and his nature and what he's done on the cross if the tone is off if the tone is wooden or if it's if it's just uninspiring if it just falls flat it, c- it actually changes the meaning. It actually numbs us. It dulls us. It, it forces us to not feel or to feel wrongly or, or, or whatever. You know, does that make sense? So I think maybe you as a pastor there too can, can help um, bring some accountability and some, some shepherding guidance. You know, it's like th- we're missing this sort of mood in our church, in our service. You know, we're, we're missing this sort of um, or, or, or this song that, that you're singing is not conveying the, the right mood right now. It's, it's feeling too chipper, or it's feeling too somber, or it's, you know, I think you can help bring some accountability there. Yeah, if, if, if I could speak to that too. I, um, I think that, like, the more kind of creativity or what you hope to see or sing that you can communicate to your team, the better. And so, like, it can be as simple as, like, this is what I was, like, singing. Even if it's not this exact song, this is what I imagine our people's feeling after this message. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I think is really, so as much direction as you can give them, the better. So whether it's passage, whether it's sermon series, whether it's sermon title, whether it's if you can get points to them as early as possible. And then what are you hoping those, like, a- as many application points because it's one, one thing that's helpful is if, if you can sing the truth that you're hoping your people walk away with from the sermon, you get to layer as many layers that you can put in your service of what you're trying to say in that, I think will help get your message across as a, as a teacher preacher. Um, and uh, just two, two more kind of practical things is if you can try to plan your services as early as possible because there is huge power in collaboration and editing. You will do better creative work when you take the long approach. And, and, and uh, when you put songs on the table, not being so emotionally attached to them is really important too, because we have to be humble enough to w- let the best idea win. And um, uh, th- that's huge. And one, just another practical thing you can do, I think that can take pressure off. If you can, like what Matt's saying, like almost agree on a catalog of songs. And then maybe it's like, okay, we've got an eight-week sermon series coming up. Okay, what are going to be the two new songs? So like have a creative planning meeting that's like, okay, this is the catalog that we're working with this year. But these are the two we're going to introduce and use for this series, and here's why. You know, so you can think more kind of uh, series about it. And then just to take pressure off, when you give your team freedom to sing songs of a catalog you've already agreed on, when the catalog sings songs about Jesus, highlights the gospel, they're all great. There's, there's like when the church is singing about the king, it's, it's great. So like looking for that like laser point connection every single time is going to be really labor intensive and tough. But if you agree on a catalog, have those couple anchor songs to the series and then just let your team kind of run with it, then I think you'll find that your team can thrive because they're operating and creating from a more authentic place rather than 
hey, these are the songs I want you to sing. Because sometimes it's, you know, we, we run into, like we have a really great female vocalist at our church, and, but certain songs just don't sound very good with a female singing it. You know, and so it's like we, we pivot based some of that, and it's like if it doesn't feel like their song as like inside of them, then it's, it's tricky. So anyway, I could talk about that for a while. But I'll add two quick things to that. Uh, one it would be your investment in that whole crew, and then two would be uh, the space, and I'll get to that in a second. A lot of lead pastors, um, or if it's a big church, people that are executive pastors, they don't have a lot of connection with the worship team, frankly. Like, there's kind of a, you, you do your thing, I've only got so much time, so I'm just going to run things, and I, I know I'm being a little harsh about it, but, like, it's just kind of how things are structured sometimes. And uh, on the other side of that whole thing, though, at my church, our pastor is extremely involved. I would not recommend this, but he has a talkback mic backstage to whisper in our ears if he feels like we should do something. Meanwhile, I'm also the MD, and I've got my own talkback in the ears, so we're juggling all that. But he's very, very, very intentional and very invested in those moments. But... Um, so like the investment in your, your worship team and your worship pastor and that crew is really pinnacle, um, making sure they're healthy, not burnt out. Uh, I mean, that's huge. Just, you know, if, if they're crushing it and they're loving it, just like, you know, you don't need to praise them like from the stage and all that, but just love on them, especially off stage. Um, and so to, to that point of like where my pastor is like, hey, we need to do this, this, this. And I'm like thinking through it while I'm trying to play and lead the band. And I'm, I'm scanning the crowd. I'm scanning the band. And I'm trying to dictate and use my intuition on what we're supposed to do. And sometimes, and this, this can be tough when you're on a grid. You've got planning center down to the minute. You've got seven services that Sunday morning, whatever. But sometimes, and this is where I find myself, I just tell the band, I'm like, let's just chill. Just like stay on the four chord or the one chord, just just chill. I would say nine out of 10 times, some sort of lyric or some sort of song is born from that. Let's relax for a moment. That's a, It's like slow down just for a minute. I know we're on a clock, I know we're on a time frame, but like there's special moments that are born there to just rest. Um, because that could speak to you, that could speak to the lead pastor, whoever's speaking, that could give you a, a shift or a new move for the sermon. Um, and again, I don't know why, but I've just, this collaboration thing has kind of like been in my head this whole, this whole talk. Does any of that make sense? Is that cool? Okay. I'll shut up now. I think we're out of time. Well, we're out of time. Uh, thank you guys for <laughs> clapping. <laughs>